Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and I'm the senior pastor at Alpha Lions Dead Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. I'm just an old football player that has been saved by grace. I played several years with the New England Patriots and with the Detroit Lions. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you into one of our services. Hi, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to view our service today. I'm Pastor Ronald Kozar, Senior Pastor of Alpha Lions Den Ministries. And following, you're going to see an information page. And I'll just simply be honest with you, we could not do what we do without your financial support. So we totally rely upon you. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you in advance for all your gifts and donations. So please view our information page, and I look forward to seeing you real soon. God bless.
the temple was built in 70 AD. Now, from that time when Israel and um, Jerusalem was overtaken and the Jews were scattered all over the world, we know that one of the um, sets of the Tetrarch, the Blood Moons, was in 1492, when the king and the queen of Spain decided to have all the Jews killed again, so they was just slaughtering Jews. And then we know that right around World War II, around that time, when Adolf Hitler was on the earth, that he had slaughtered seven million Jews. So we know that there have been all these attempts to get the Jews off the face of the earth, but God has been faithful. So we can look at that time period from 70 AD, which was the destruction of the temple, to until about 1948 when Israel became a nation again. There was a period there, or really about to the 1500s is what is technically called the Dark Ages. But we have this period that I, I love to, to um, preach and teach about because honestly, a lot of people until they receive the revelation they take it for granted that we've always had this Bible. I mean, for us English-speaking people, we never had, we didn't have this Bible until the 1500s. I mean, this Bible wasn't even put in English until the King James Version came out. So we had all those years where this Bible was just simply written in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. And people used to go to church English-speaking people, and they would listen to people speak in Greek or Hebrew or mostly Latin from the Catholic Church. So we couldn't even have read the Bible. So really, how much revelation could there have been? So as I study and study this Dark Age period and how we come out of this Dark Age period, I get into a lot of the writings and the, the teachings that the early Roman Church had. And it was their point of view in the early church. And, and you almost, and there's a side of me that wants to say you can't blame them, even though you can blame them, because they, they looked at it in this sense. Okay, for all these years, the Jews were God's chosen people. But then God sent the Messiah to the Jewish people, and they crucified the Messiah. So their point of view was, was how could we listen to people that have crucified the Messiah? So they looked at it as such a, as such a negative thing that they turned against the Jewish people. Where in all actuality, in the reality of things, it was God's master plan to send his son. Do you understand that? It, it was not the Jews. I mean, even though they were the people, it was just like when God said, for, for this reason I raised Pharaoh up to show my power in him. In Romans 9. So there was this, there was this unfolding of a plan that God had had even before the foundation of the earth. So it really wasn't the Jews' fault, even though it was the Jews' fault. But as people was trying to grasp a hold of this, there was a there was a destruction of the temple, so the Jews couldn't have fulfilled their law anyway. And I've been preaching that for about 25 years. The Jews could not fulfill this old covenant. Nobody can fill this old covenant right now. People may think they could do bits and pieces, and we always try to migrate back to it. But my friend, once that temple was destroyed, you can't fulfill the Old Testament, period. <clears throat> like even when we, we observe the feast days. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, on the night of Passover, when the Passover meal, not the Last Supper, even though it was the, his Last Supper, I call it the Passover meal, so you know exactly what it was. When the Passover meal was there, it says, after that meal, Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it and said, this is my body. Then after the supper, after the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of a new covenant. So there was a new covenant that was going to be established. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this, this blood, drink my blood, he said, you will proclaim my death until I return. So we're coming out of a season right now where we have honored and we have remembered the Passover. 
Now, we really don't honor Easter as far as Easter is because I can't really find anywhere in the Bible that it tells us to honor the resurrection. I mean, I know Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We're thankful for the resurrection and, and all that. But I've even been studying Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, listen to this, Jesus' goal and purpose when he came to this earth was not to resurrect from the dead. His purpose and his reason for coming to this earth was to be crucified and to die for us. And listen, more important than that, his number one reason and purpose and goal of coming to the earth was one thing, and that was to fill, fulfill the Passover. Jesus had to fulfill the Passover. That's why he came to this earth. That was his mission when he came to this earth. He had one thing in mind. He said, I've been given the power to lay my life down and to take it back up again. We know that the feasts of God had to be fulfilled. They have to be fulfilled. So Jesus had to fulfill the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost. That was his purpose of coming to the earth. Now listen, when we go, I, I'm just going to just forget what I was going to preach tonight. Let me just go to... Let's just look at this. Well, first, let me tie it in right here real quick. Our ministry knows about the three times of the year you're to give. There are the three high holy feasts. There are the traveling feasts. And those feasts are Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacle. Them are the three times of the year we're to give. But now listen, from Passover, not from resurrection, from Passover, to Pentecost is 50 days exactly. But we know in Acts 1 6, I've been preaching this for 25 years and still getting a revelation on the one verse. Jesus had to come back for 40 days and teach them things concerning the kingdom. And every time I mention that and I, I fulfill a revelation that God gives me, he gives me a deeper one and another one. So listen to this. When Jesus resurrected from the dead and he told Mary, look, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to the Father. Do you know that there was a period of 40 days where Jesus was on this earth and he was ministering to the people and the disciples and the apostles and preaching and teaching and preparing them for the kingdom. Now, after the 40-day period, we know that he was standing there, and when he ascended into heaven, what was standing there? There was angels there. Well, what we know, and one of the first things that I want to teach you about, about really learning about these feasts and the benefits from these feasts and for those people that give during these three times of the year, there are seven blessings that I can guarantee you that there are seven things that God will honor you with. And the first one is he will dispatch an angel on your behalf. Amen. I'm telling you, just the other day I was in the house with my wife and she was doing some paint. There was things in the room she had to paint. And I just had this small, still voice say to me, don't, just don't leave the house. And I mean, I was out the door. I was going to my truck. And I came back in the house, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going to stay here with you today for a couple of hours. I didn't know I wasn't going to paint. I said, I'll just sit here. And we'll have some fellowship. I'll drink a coffee and spend some time together. So I went to sit down. Two big parts of our outreach are represented here. First of all, on the left is our His Food Ministry truck. We send this truck out every single Monday, Thursday, and Saturday to pick up food and we do a free food giveaway at our church once again that's every single monday thursday and saturday and then on the right is our alpha lion's den ministry church bus where we pick up people and bring them to our church on wednesday and sunday
Okay, this is the battle. It's straight down. is in Exodus 23 and it talks about 23 14 it says three times a year you shall keep a feast unto me the, the unleavened bread the, the um, 
Feast of Pentecost and also the Feast of Tabernacles. But in Exodus 23, verse 20, the first promise that God gave is in verse 20. It says, Behold, I'll send an angel before you to keep you in the way and actually to bring you into the place which I have prepared for you. Beware of him and obey his voice and do not provoke him for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then promise number two is God will be an enemy to your enemies. So I've really memorized these and I've got to rely on them and depend upon them. And then during certain year, times of the year, I know that these are the promises that God has given us. And I've received more blessings, more promotions, more honor, more just wonderful things in my life during this season from Passover to Pentecost. But I, I want to share with you a couple times in the New Testament because a lot of people go, well, New Testament, Old Testament, they're different. And I, and I mean, I was always taught that too, but I really didn't know uh, how much of a difference and, and why we really have to know what we know. But, but let's go into, um, let's say, Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Now there's a couple examples right here in Matthew 26 that it, it talks about, and, and I'm just going to talk about the Passover season and the dispatching of angels. Because I have people say that we don't even talk about the Passover in the New Testament. Listen, I'll tell you one thing it does not talk about at Easter. It never talks about Easter. Because Easter is a pagan holiday. But one thing it does talk about is Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's all through the New Testament. Now, several messages ago, I did a whole, ser a whole sermon on just how many times the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is mentioned in the New Testament. It's through every chapter. When you read the book of John, it's in every single chapter. But right here in Matthew 26, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days it's the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So it is during the feast of Passover. It sets the time as this season. Then it says the chief priests and the scribes and elders of the people assembled at the, at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, no, not during the feast. Well, what feast? It was the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it out on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and then given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of, some of this, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for what? My burial. So he, Jesus, is looking at his death and his burial. And then he said this, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, what gospel? He is talking about the Passover, his death, and his burial. Is preached in the entire world. What this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now, why? Because she gave an incredible gift. That, that perfume was about the same worth of one year wages. Now think about that. Think about that kind of gift that she just poured it on Jesus' head and he said, she's preparing me for my burial. And he's stating that she did this during the Passover season. And because she did that, whatever she had just done will be proclaimed and teached through all generations. Listen, we're talking about what that woman did today in 2017. It's phenomenal the impact that you have given during this season. I believe that this is a season unlike any other season in the world. And I'm talking from Passover to Pentecost. 
There is a 50-day window there that I just believe that the opportunity for you to receive blessings and to receive supernatural abundance physically, spiritually, and financially is, is available to us that, that know this. Then in verse 17, it says, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover? And he said to them, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is now at hand. My time, that Moedim we talk about. Then what did Jesus say? I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared what? The Passover. So this is all around the Passover. Did Jesus keep the Passover? Absolutely. Then let's go over to verse 52. <clears throat> it says this, but, uh, Matthew 26, 52. But Jesus said unto them, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I can pray now to my Father? Why do you think Jesus said this? Do you not think that I cannot pray now to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus knew that during this time that for those who were faithful to the Passover, that the number one promise that God gave is that he would dispatch or send angels to fight your battles for you. This is the one thing that Jesus said. Now, when you're talking about this all through this chapter, all through, all through chapter 26, this is where Jesus is saying, look at verse 39, Matthew 26, 39. This is when Jesus was in the garden. Well, verse 38, Matthew 26, 38. Then he said to them, My soul, my mighty emotions and will, is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. And then he went a little further and fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, Listen, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Third time in verse 44. So he left them, he went away again and prayed a third time saying what? The same words. What words? Oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless, from me, unless I drink it, then let your will be done. Then we know that Jesus goes into betrayal and then rape. Boom, right into the Passover. Now we know that when Jesus had the Passover with them after the Passover, he took bread, said, this is my body. Then after supper, he took what? The cup. When Jesus got to this point, when he reached the garden, he knew that it was like a funnel. He was coming down to that final hour. And when he got to that point, listen, resurrection was not a problem because Jesus was eternal. But death, to know that his purpose was the Passover. Remember, we read in John chapter 1, the very first thing were John the Baptist, who was his cousin. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming over the hillside to be baptized by him, he acknowledged him. He said, Behold, what? The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, Jesus was the Passover Lamb of God. Jesus was, in a sense, God's greatest gift to mankind that was given on the Passover. Now, Jesus, when he got to this point where he knew that he had fulfilled every single thing he had to fulfill, and he got to that point to where the one thing, the first feast that he was sent to the earth to fulfill was the Passover. And he knew that he had to die for this. He said, Father, if it be possible, 
let this cup pass from me. What cup? The resurrection from the dead? No. That was nothing to him because he was eternal. He had the ability to lay his life down and to pick it back up again. The resurrection for, for God, that was not it. It was the Passover. It was the dying part in his flesh for his flesh to be crucified and offered to be offered up as a sacrifice for the sin of all mankind. He said, if this be possible, let this cup pass. What cup? The cup of Passover. But what happened then? We know that at that time, look, if you go over to uh, Mark, this is another aspect of our outreach. We have the Dairy Junior High School that our ministry purchased. And what we did is we put apartments, we refurbished apartments across the top of this building that we rent out to families. So this is another very large part of our ministry. Were you going to sing a song tonight? I will. All right, give me a sing song standing right there, the same song you sang earlier. And you're going to close with that. So you sing the song. This is a cloud. It's cloud. It's cloud. Restart. Restart. A restart is to move like a star. Like a restart like this. And when you say fish, compare. And when you say for this, come and take this away from me. I can make this thing. I put my I put my left mouth open my eyes. I put my uh, uh, says that <coughs> okay here it is 
Now, listen to this. In Luke, Luke 22, verse 39. Listen to this. It said, Luke 22, 39. And coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. And as he was accustomed, Jesus, this was a part of his custom. And the disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, this appointed time, this, this proper place, this positioning, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And as he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this, what? Cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, after Jesus prayed this, something immediately happened. Because it was at that season of Passover and he asked the Father, he said, listen, if it be possible, let this cup, let this Passover, let this sacrifice, let this pass. And look what happened in verse 43. Then, boom, an angel appeared to him from heaven. Why would an angel have to appear to Jesus? The angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This angel came. Is not Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, is he not more stronger than the angels? Absolutely he is. But he still yet got to that point in his flesh where his flesh was so exhausted. And because of the promises that we know of the Passover season, that an that a obligation of the Father God is first thing is he will dispatch an angel on your behalf. And that angel will actually fight your battles for you. So when Jesus was in this position, even though he said, I can pray and I can get legions of angels, 12 legions of angels, they can wipe out the entire earth, just boom. We see this process and it is all around Passover. Every single time is around Passover. That this angel came and ministered unto Jesus. Now look, a lot of people say about, about these promises and, and the things that we preach about, oh, that's never in the New Testament. Go in your Bible to Acts 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm trying to show you about God's promises. He says about the feast days, he says the word of preach, teach, the word of proclaim them, which means preach, teach, and instruct. And there are holy convocations. The holy convocation means it's a holy dress rehearsal. So these are specific appointed times by God to word of preach, teach, and instruct people on how to do that. Now listen, do we not have a calendar? Absolutely, we have a calendar. It's a Gregorian calendar. It was made by Pope Gregory. So he designed his own calendar. Now, the reason why this church from Rome designed their own calendar is like I began to say this evening, is they wanted to get everybody away from the Jewish feasts. Why? Because the Jews, that was all that was ever followed from day one. The Torah was written to the Jewish people. But they was looking at it from the side that, okay, God sent his son to the earth, and to the people that he came to, they crucified him. So they wanted to get as far away as they could from the feast day. So what I want you to see is it was an intentional decision. People think today because we've been taught by that church, by the church from Rome, when there was a one world rule, a one world order, and there was only one real church, they put in these holidays to intentionally get people away from God's holy days. Now, there are people still today that argue and they think that it's the same. 
They really believed that Jesus was crucified on Friday and that he resurrected on Sunday and that was Easter Sunday. And that everybody's supposed to honor and worship the resurrection. And that's not scriptural because Easter, Easter is not Passover. They're two totally different. One's a holiday created by man and the other one is a holy day that is created by God. So listen, on the Gregorian calendar, we have Easter. And we have the worship of Easter and how they do it with rabbits and eggs and all the things that people do. But listen, I mean, I'm saying this humbly and as softly as I possibly can. The world does not even know Jesus. Listen, the people in the world really don't even know Jesus unless they're born again. But the church that is still in that period of darkness that has not come out of that darkness, they still think the worship of those holidays and those pagan traditions are a, uh, a fulfillment or a completion of God's calendar. And they're not. Because, see, God made his own calendar. So God has a calendar over here where God on God's calendar... He has what we call holy days. Now they would be like Sabbath is the first one. The second one is Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacle. That's what's on God's calendar. Christmas and Easter is not on God's calendar. God has his calendar over here and his appointed days on these days. And then listen, the world that don't even know Jesus, I'm talking the world that don't know Jesus, they have a calendar over here. And they celebrate New Year's Eve. They celebrate April 1st, which is April Fool's Day. They celebrate Easter. And they celebrate Christmas. Now on God's calendar over here, God has his days that he honors. And there are two separate different groups of days. They're not the same. So people say, well, it doesn't talk about the Passover or unleavened bread or the feast or anything like that in the New Testament. And I'm thinking, it's all through the New Testament. So we're in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Now listen, it says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. So it was the church in existence. Yeah, the church was alive. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And, be and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, it, it pleased the Jews that they were killing off the apostles and the, and the disciples. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him the four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people. When? After the Passover. So, right here in Acts 12, the first, what, four or five verses, it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it also talks about the Passover. Now, the church was keeping the feast. Now, when you go back and study the early church, the church was keeping the feast. When did they stop celebrating the feast days? It was when, after, first, a lot of prophecies are dual prophecies. And what I mean by that is they have a dual meaning. They happened once years ago, and then they have the opportunity to happen again. Now, when that second temple was in existence when Jesus was there, he said this temple will be destroyed. And there was an antichrist. And there was a desolation of the temple. Just as there will be halfway through the tribulation. Listen to me. Daniel spoke of the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist will set up himself in the holy place, in the temple of God. 
He said this would happen after 42 months. That is a three and a half year period. The Jews will be handed over into the Gentile hands and they will be tread upon for another 42 months. Now hear me. When Jesus was on the earth back here, the exact same thing happened. Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again. And he prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. Now, we know according to history that the temple was destroyed. Now, when the desecration took place, one of the captains, the leaders back there, actually set himself up in the temple and declared himself as God. Now that was a fulfillment of the prophecy that said the temple, that the Antichrist, there's, a, there's many Antichrists, Jesus said. Now I know we're looking for the Antichrist, or let's say the last Antichrist. But there was an Antichrist there that put himself up in the temple. You can go back and read it. And they sacrificed pigs to him. And he said that he was God and stood in the temple and proclaimed himself as God. And then all the Jews, they were run out, of, run out of Jerusalem. They were scattered all over the world. And there was a one, one world rule. It was the Romans. They ruled the absolute. What you view right here is our parsonage. We've rented out this parsonage to families for 15 years. And then right to the right of the parsonage, you will be able to view our church. But as I said, all these are parts of our ministry. We're a multifaceted ministry, and I really want to share that with you being the senior pastor of Alpha Lions Den Ministry, so you know really what our ministry represents. And this is our new Bible verse. It's from So the church was in existence. And the church was honoring the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. He was bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, all of a sudden, wham! An angel of the Lord was dispatched by God. An angel of the Lord stood beside him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and said, Rise up. He raised him up, saying, Rise quickly. And his chains immediately fell off his hands, and then the angel said to him, Gird up yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did, and then he said to him, Put on your garments and follow me. This is exactly what happens off of what we're told in Exodus 23. When it says, God will dispatch an angel for you, and he will tell you what you're to do, and you're to listen unto him. Well, listen, the reason why this isn't happening to the church as much as it should be is because they're not taught it. So they don't know the revelation of it. They think, oh, they were just old feasts, or oh, those were just done away with. No, they're not done away with. 
I mean, I could go into Zechariah 14 and preach on that whole chapter about when the nations, when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom on this earth, that the nations that don't even know him as Savior, that they will honor him. They will be forced to honor Jesus through the millennium. How? Through the Feast of Tabernacles. They will have to honor him through the Feast of Tabernacles. That's during Jesus' thousand-year reign. So how can we think now that all of a sudden, for some reason, just because the church don't know the feast days and don't preach and teach them, that, that they're not that important? These are seasons, <coughs> they're Mohadines, that God promised to dispatch angels. This is one of the greatest times of the year. If you've never given, I mean supernaturally, and given a gift that hurts, or to do something extraordinary for the kingdom of God, do it. Do it from the Passover to Pentecost. There's a 50-day period there where I believe that the supernatural realm of God and the things of the kingdom are just swirling around you. But you've got to be looking. You've got to be waiting and you've got to be looking for the things to take place. I, I just love these things about the angels. I, I have... I have five, I have five times here, five times where, where the angels came that was one of the most important times in the history of the world. And there was an angel dispatched on every single one of them in the New Testament. I just don't have enough time to get into it tonight, so I'm going to have to do that on Sunday. Did I say, hold on one second. Yeah, I showed you in Luke 22, 43, where it said an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. But if you look back in, in Luke 22, verse 1, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. So what I want you to see is during these times of the year that God gave us these promises, God gave us seven things that he promised to do for us. And the first thing out of those seven was he would dispatch an angel. Now, I can show you probably 15 of them. I just touched on a few tonight, and I can't get into the top five that I have chosen until Sunday because I, I really want to do them justice. But it is all through the New Testament. It, but see, just like we preach and teach, until it's revealed unto you, you don't know it. You just read over it. I mean, you'd, you'd be reading this if we weren't talking about the feast and learning about the things. You'd say, well, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. You just read right over that because it doesn't mean anything to you. But man, once you're looking for it and seeing how many times it's in the New Testament, you're grabbing onto that. You're thinking, man, this is all through the New Testament. There is something important. God does dispatch angels during the Passover season, and he does fight our battles, and Let's go back to Exodus 23. <coughs> now, for our church, they know these seven things, but a lot of people are watching us and other pastors and ministers on Cornerstone Television, or now they're tuning in on YouTube to watch us. But, but these things here, in Exodus 23, verse 20 says, Behold, I'll send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared to you. Verse 22, but if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I'll be an enemy of your enemies. Well, listen, this is exactly what happened to Peter in, in Acts chapter 12. He said, I'm going to dispatch an angel for you right on the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Peter, in Acts 12, was thrown in prison. And the church was praying for him. Well, God dispatched an angel. Boom. Now the angel then says to Peter, Guard yourself. Put your sandals on. Stand up quickly. Why do, why do you think the angel had to talk to Peter like that? Listen, you don't think Peter was getting up quick if he was laying in prison, shackled but with two chains, and they're waiting to kill him? 
And an angel immediately shows up, breaks the gates open, and he's standing there. It's all free for Peter to leave. Do you think that angel even had to say anything? No. Even the angel knew what was written in Acts 23. Because he knew if he gave him instruction and Peter did as he was told, then the angel can act on his behalf. And we know right after that that Herod died. He was consumed by worms. He died. Now watch this. Exodus 23, verse 22. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. And I'll be an adversary to your adversaries. That's the second point. For my angel will go before you and he'll bring you into this land of the Parasites, Amorites, Hittites, and all the enemies. Then in verse 24 he says, You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them. Listen then, it says, Nor do according to their customs, but you shall overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. This is where I believe the church has to separate from the things of the world. And it absolutely amazes me that during those two times of the year for people that honor the feasts, how much persecution that they take because they don't want to go and honor an Easter bunny. Every, every day of the year for the born-again believer, we honor and serve a resurrected Savior. Do we not? For those of us that know Jesus, that is our life. I have committed my life to serve a risen Savior. Now that one time of the year, the 14th day of the first month, which is Nisan or Abib, God himself on his calendar has said, you are to do this in remembrance of me. You're to honor me on this day that you're to honor the Passover. It's not about even saying the death. It's not about saying Jesus had to come to die. It's not about saying Jesus had to come to resurrect. It's not about saying anything about the Last Supper. It's not about talking about a great painting. It's not about talking about the Easter Bunny or a bunch of chicken eggs. It's not talking about any of that. God, who wrote the book. God, who made his own calendar. God, who said, these are my appointed convocations. God said that you would honor the Passover. Now, I have listened for the last probably 10 for sure, Easter's and Passover's to what people are saying, and it amazes me that the church has no idea really about Passover. And honestly, they struggle with Easter. Because it doesn't fit. So they don't know if it was Monday, Thursday. <clears throat> they don't know if it was Good Friday. They don't know what time it was Saturday or if it really was Easter Sunday. And they bounce back and forth with all these dates and times and dates. And then they celebrate the resurrection, which we was, we was never told to do that. But anyway, they go off on all these other distractions and they'll talk about absolutely everything until you mention the Passover and the Passover is the thing that God told us to honor so why do we have such a hard time honoring the Passover and getting away from the traditions of men Jesus himself in Matthew taught the disciples. He said there's only one thing on the earth that's stronger than the Word of God. He said it's the traditions of men. And they said why? He said because you set up the traditions of men and it blocks mankind from the Word of God. 
It keeps mankind from the truth because you cannot experience this type of supernatural living until you step into that realm. Someday we're going to stand before God and I'm telling you when God comes back, I always say this, when God comes back, when Jesus comes back during the feast to fulfill the final three feasts and he sets up his kingdom on this earth and we rule and reign with him, he is not going to celebrate Easter or Christmas. He, he will not do that. First of all, because Jesus is a Jew. And secondly, his whole purpose for coming to the earth was the Passover. And the reason why he's coming to the earth the first time and he's coming the second time to the earth is to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles, to rule and reign on the earth. It is all about the feast. It's not just somebody saying, like I said, we will have a whole revelation that God puts into the earth. It's like the coming of the Messiah. And then people that don't know when the Messiah is coming, they'll say, oh, no one knows the day or the hour. And they'll pull one little verse out and try to ex extinguish a whole fire that God has created by hundreds of verses. They'll pull one verse out of context and go, well, no one knows it there they are. Or they'll talk about the feast days and they'll go, oh, that's old time. When you study early church history, I am telling you, you could go back and read the documents. It was intentional by the early Roman church to make decisions to get all of their descendants away from God's feast day. That is why the Council of Nicaea took place. That is why Constantine did what he did. That's why Pope Gregory did what he did by changing the calendar. Every single one of them intentionally did that to keep us or hide the feast days from us. In a sense, to keep them in darkness or during the dark ages. Now, the beauty of this is in Acts 3.21. Acts 3.21, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Romans, Corinthians, Acts 3, verse 21. It says, whom heaven must receive until the restoration of all things. They would preach Jesus until the restoration of all things. So listen, Jesus is being held in heaven until the restoration of all things. Now when I started out today, I said, when you go into the process, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we hit 10, we're here, but we need to work the process of restoration. There was a period of dark ages where we absolutely lost all knowledge, all revelation. We didn't even have a Bible, for crying out loud. The only language we had was Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. So if you spoke English, you were clueless. You never read a Bible. You weren't taught anything out of the Bible. We were just dead people walking around. And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther came out with the declaration of the just shall live by faith. And ever since then, it's been a clawing and a scratching and a digging and a fighting by men and women of God to find truth. Listen, until God put the blood moons in the sky and it was revealed to people in the church about the blood moons and the tetrods and how they fell on the Passover and the, and the Feast of Tabernacles, we didn't even really give them much recognition at all. I mean, I know for, for me, that's what really sealed the deal with me. And then I went on his quest to really study and find out more about him. But when I saw God himself honor him, I thought, well, I better honor him. Then I started thinking, well, okay, when Peter was in prison, boom, Passover, God dispatched angels. 
Then I thought the woman with the alabaster box of perfume. Boom. Passover. When I start thinking about, okay, when they were leaving the promised land, go, I mean, leaving Egypt, going into the promised land, a big angel stood in the middle of the road. Boom. Passover. I start thinking, okay, right in between the season, uh, 40 days after the Passover, 10 days before Pentecost, in, in, in Acts 1 6, where Jesus ascended, all of a sudden there was two angels standing there. Well, why was two angels dispatched then? Because it was the Passover to Pentecost season. Look, Acts chapter 1. It's just all over the place. Acts chapter 1 says like this. Jesus come back, spent 40 days with them, speaking to them, teaching to them things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts 1, 3. And being assembled uh, together, he said to them, do not part from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. Well, why would he tell them to do that? Because they had to wait for the fourth feast, which was the feast of Pentecost. So they all stayed in Jerusalem. My question to you was, was what was Jesus doing for 40 days on the earth? Jesus was on the earth for 40 days in his resurrected body, teaching them things concerning the kingdom. Here's his ascension. He said, verse 10. Well, verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, they watched, and all of a sudden, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, he, as he went up, behold, there was two men. What were they? Angels. Angels. They weren't rabbits. It said, Behold, two men stood by them in what? White apparel. And they said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So they returned to Jerusalem from what? The mount called all of that which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. So they were waiting in the upper room. That's where they were staying. That's where they went back up to. But here's just another time where people go, oh, I can't find that nowhere in the New Testament. I'm like, look, it's all through the New Testament. Here's your homework for Sunday. Do you know on Passover? The Passover lamb was crucified. <coughs> then we have this season where we're watching for the supernatural and angels being dispatched and tremendous healing, and tremendous deliverance, tremendous provision, tremendous blessings, tremendous healings, tremendous everything during the season. Well, all of a sudden, when Mary went to the tomb, what did she see at the tomb? Angels. When, they, when the one person got to the tomb, there was a big angel sitting on a rock at the tomb. When Peter got at the tomb, he looked down in the tomb, there was two angels sitting inside the tomb. One at the, where the feet of Jesus was and one where the head of Jesus was. I could just keep showing you time and time and time again that from Passover to Pentecost, the supernatural is just the windows of heaven are open for those who know and are looking and expecting God to do great things. I can't wait to preach when I'm going to pre preach Friday, but you got to be here and you got to tune in for it. I'm going to close right here tonight. Please pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this evening, for this meat eaters Bible study. I thank you for this, just this part of the truth of your word, Lord God, about these traveling feasts, about these high holy days, these three times of the year, Lord God, that if you told us we would be faithful you would be faithful and you would dispatch an angel. So Lord, we look for the supernatural during this time. We give expecting during this time. We expect healing. We expect deliverance. We expect the supernatural during this window. So we thank you for moving on our behalf. Amen.
Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and right now I've been pastoring a church in Derry, Pennsylvania for approximately 16 years. I have known Jesus as my Lord and Savior for 41 years. And during this time, God has given me a burden for the body of Christ. Three specific things is spiritually, physically, and financially. I'm going to share with you a story that is so powerful and life-changing regarding some of the things that have happened in my life in the last two years. About two years ago, I was having a problem with my vision. I didn't tell anybody, but I was going through this difficulty of seeing and just struggling with this. And I've watched so many people struggle in the church with different things physically. And I understand this. If you're going through a physical problem, it's going to affect you spiritually. So I have a burden. I have a burden for the body of Christ. So today's show is going to be able to help you help others physically, which will also help them spiritually. So I, I have this burden to get back to my back to my story. And I'm struggling with this as, as so many other people struggle. And I look at people in the body of Christ who struggle with being overweight, who struggle with diabetes, who struggle with macular degeneration, who struggle with arthritis, which gets into our back and our hips and our knees. And all these issues that I watch people in the body of Christ struggle with. And here I was, a former NFL football player, pastoring a church. Now everybody would have thought that I had my life all together. But as I said, two years ago, two years ago, almost to the day, I began to lose my sight. And I went through this struggle of really trusting God. As I, as I was, my vision was declining, I knew that God spoke to me one day and he said that I will send you an answer. And sometimes that's all you have and that's all you need is a word from God. And God has transformed my life. Today you're going to hear of a story that is mind-boggling how God can bring healing into your physical body through natural holistic products. God has really blessed a man by the name of Noel Turner from New Zealand with these products and I heard about them and that's what you're gonna hear on on this show it's a it's a all-natural way to bring health and restoration to your physical body so I was in our church I struggled with this for about six months by myself I didn't tell anybody and I was in the bottom of our basement helping my wife Deborah with the food ministry and I thought I ha had something in my left eye and when I closed my left eye and I looked out of my right eye I was blind I couldn't see anything and it really scared me. So they rushed me to, the, to an eye specialist and then that eye specialist said that they had to take me to an optometrist. Now he looked at me and he told me that I had this thing happen in my eye which is an occlusion. Now an occlusion is totally different from macular degeneration because an occlusion is like a stroke inside your eyeball. So all my veins had ruptured. There was a, a, an explosion inside my eye. And thank God that it did not go out the back of my eye because it probably would have killed me from a brain aneurysm. But my eye was strong enough to hold the fluids. But what it did is it pushed the pupil out the front of my eye, causing me to go blind, not to see. So the only thing that I found out is I had to, I had to see a doctor. And the doctor told me the only way to, to, to be able to treat this is I had to get a shot in my eye once a month for 16 months. I had to go in once a month and get a shot in my eye. And, and the whole time I just prayed about an answer. I said, God, you said that you were going to send me an answer. And just like many of you today, you struggle physically and that affects you spiritually. So if you're struggling with overweight, being diabetic, or diabetes, macular degeneration, or if you have arthritic issues, bad back, hips, knees, anything like that. Inflammation is the number one cause to all these issues. So we have the answer today. And I want to bring you some good news. But listen, you need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when you when you need change, when you want change, when you're sick and tired of that, God will send you the answer. 
So call some friends, tell them to tune in. It's going to be a great show. Hi, I'm Pastor Ronald Kozor, and you just got done watching a video that we had put together about a year ago now. And this is just a brief summary and a testimony. I could not wait to come back and share this with you to prove the product of Freezor. Because let's face it, the people that don't try it, they do not believe that it works. But me, firsthand experience, I know this, a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person who has an argument. So what you just heard on that brief little testimony clip was my beginning stages of experimenting with the Freezor product. And now today, when we're making this video for you, is over one year later. Now, if we go back a year ago, when, when you just saw the video that we put together, I was going blind in this eye, and I just began to receive my sight. My knees were coming back. Everybody thought, well, that could be working, and it could not be working. Well, now it's been over a year. I just went to my eye doctor, and they tested my eyes again. My vision is actually 2016. There is no fluid in my eye whatsoever. My eye has healed back 100%. Now, previous to my, to my beginnings with the Freezor product, my eye was filling up with blood. I was hemorrhaging with inside my eyeball. And I actually have the scans of every single month for 16 long months. I had received a shot in my eye. And I started to take the Freezor product and, and honestly, I am telling you, it healed my eyes up. It's been over one year now, and I have 2016 vision, perfect vision, no more shots, thank you, Jesus. My knees, my right knee was absolutely shot. I had no cartilage in my leg whatsoever. My left leg was going. Here we are one year later, taking a Freezor product. I take two Omegas every morning and two every night, two a stacks of thin every morning and two at night. And I also take the weight loss shakes. So listen, if you're having problem with your knees or any type of arthritis, one year later, I ride the bike now three days a week, five miles every single time. I go in and work out for my legs twice a week and uh, things are absolutely incredible. So if you're struggling with weight loss, that's number one. I take the, the weight loss protein uh, shakes that Freezor has. I actually started out taking the children's shakes. So they have two of those um, shakes. One is chocolate, one is vanilla. You can switch them back and forth. That's what I started to lose weight. Now, I lost 45 pounds, 45 pounds by taking the, the weight loss, just the shakes. And then off of the other two products that I said, the omega-3 and the astaxanthin, I've got my eyesight back, so it helps you with weight loss. If you're diabetic, we've helped so many people that, are, that have diabetes or struggling that are diabetics. I really encourage you to try it. The next thing is, is those that struggle with arthritis, neck, back, or knee pain. I am telling you, it will fight, the, it's an anti-inflammatory, I believe it's one of the best in the world. It has absolutely changed my life. So we have a 90 day, a three month money back guarantee. And if you call in, you'll see an information page at the, at the end of this, <laughs> and you can dial the 800 number. That is 1-888-962-4888. Tell them Pastor Ron sent you. You'll buy a bottle and get a bottle free. Then you got a 90 day, money back guarantee if the product does not work for you and you are unsatisfied with the product ship it back in and get your money back but i am telling you folks it worked for me i lost 45 pounds i got my eyesight back my legs my knees are doing fine my back i saw a chiropractor for arthritis in my back for 14 years and i have not seen a chiropractor for my back or anything else in the past year since I started taking the Freezor free products. So I'm telling you, it worked for me and I know it'll work for you. And what do you have to lose? It's a money back guarantee. So please give it a, give it a shot. You could go to my website, you'll also see that, 
on our information page, which we'll be following after this video. But my website is team, T-E-A-M, Freezor, F-R-E-Z-Z-O-R.com, forward slash Pastor Ron. Go to the website, check out the products, listen to the doctors on there, listen to the testimonies. It's a phenomenal website. Then dial the 800 number. It's 888-962-4888. Tell them Pastor Ron sent you. Buy a bottle, buy your first bottle, they'll give you a bottle free. You can't beat that. So it, it's a great way to get started. And listen, I'm, I'm here just to help you because I know that pain. I know how bad that hurts. So I, I want the best for you. Just try it, and I hope it'll help you. So God bless you, and I'll be talking to you again. I pray that you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Till next time, see ya.